Dear listener, to take us through today's Philothea program is Father George Kochalikal, the spiritual director of Philothea Missionaries. Welcome to the program. Today is the second Sunday of Ordinary Time, and our gospel reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. As John stood with two of his disciples, Jesus passed, and John stared hard at him and said, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Hearing this, the two disciples followed Jesus. Jesus turned round, saw them following, and said, What do you want? They answered, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where do you live? Come and see, he replied. So they went and saw where he lived and stayed with him the rest of that day. It was about the tenth hour. One of these two, who became followers of Jesus after hearing what John had said, was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. Early the next morning, Andrew met his brother and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And he took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked hard at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas meaning rock. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Called by Christ Last Sunday, we celebrated the Feast of the Baptism of Jesus. Guided by the readings chosen by the church for that feast, we reflected on how Jesus at his baptism was assured of his Father's love. We came to see that Jesus had come into the world to save everyone, to become a servant, and he carried out his work in a most humble way. This Sunday, the church wants to turn our eyes to ourselves, to look at ourselves and to discover our own calling, our beginnings, to realize that we too have been called by God for a task, that we have been called to follow Christ, to be holy like Him and to bring people to faith in Him. This is a summary of this Sunday's three readings. Let us now examine them. Among the so-called historical books in the Bible, there are two which are called the first and second books of Samuel. Actually, only the first book deals with the prophet Samuel and his work. The first chapter of this book we are told the story of Samuel's birth. A devout Israelite, Elkanah by name, had two wives. The first, Hannah. She was barren, while the second had several children. Though dearly loved by her husband, Hannah had no peace. While on a pilgrimage to the sanctuary of Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept at that time, she made a solemn promise to Yahweh. If Yahweh would give her a son, she would dedicate him to the Lord, put him at the service of the sanctuary. And God listened to Hannah's prayer. She conceived and gave birth to a son, whom she called Samuel, a name that means the one I asked from Yahweh. Samuel must have been three or four years old when Hannah took him to the sanctuary and presented him to Eli, the priest, to fulfill her promise, I make him over to Yahweh for the rest of his life. Eli, the priest, took care of the child as if he were his own. The first book of Samuel tells us how his parents visited the sanctuary once a year 
on each occasion. Hannah presented her child with a new white tunic she personally wove for him to wear while helping the priest in his duties in the sanctuary. Samuel was still a boy, perhaps no older than twelve, when Yahweh spoke to him for the first time, as we have heard in the first reading of this Sunday. Two points deserve particular attention in this passage. First, Samuel's obedience to Eli the priest and his obedience to the Lord. Second, Samuel's readiness to grasp well and to carry out God's instructions. We hear Samuel telling the Lord, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Then the writer adds, Samuel grew up and Yahweh was with him. Yahweh let no word of his fall to the ground. See Samuel's obedience and his readiness to grow with God's instructions. Eventually, Samuel became the leader of the people of Israel, a faithful prophet who conveyed God's message to the people and their leaders. The Gospel of this Sunday, taken from John, narrates the call of two disciples. Samuel in the old, in this case, now the two disciples. The two disciples were the disciples of John the Baptist, who met Jesus for the first time. Though John the Evangelist wrote his gospel some 50 to 60 years after the meeting of the two disciples with Jesus, he still remembered the exact time of the day when that meeting took place. He tells us it was at about four in the afternoon. No wonder he knows the time because he was one of them. John gives the name of only one of the two disciples, Andrew the brother of Peter, since the second disciple, as I said in all probability, was he himself. The first meeting with Jesus left in John's heart an indelible impression for the rest of his life. That is why he remembers even the detail, the time of his meeting and other details. But the intention of John in narrating his first meeting with Jesus was not so much to let his Christians know how he had come to know the Master, but to help them realize that what happened to him is repeated almost to the letter in every person who becomes a disciple of Jesus. Notice the various steps in the narration of John. First, Jesus, we are told, happened to pass by. John and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. He must have been speaking to them about Jesus when Jesus happened to pass by. All excited, John, Evangel, uh, John Baptist pointed him to them and exclaimed, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Look, there is the Lamb of God. The two disciples little imagined that Jesus had long since prepared that passing along, his first encounter with them. They did not know that it was planned by Jesus. He knew it. Now, in a second step, Jesus invited the two disciples to a deeper knowledge of himself. There was eagerness in the two disciples to know Jesus and eagerness in Jesus also to reveal himself to them. John expresses this beautifully in three brief sentences. Jesus asked them, What do you want? And they respond, Rabbi, where do you live? Jesus answers, Come and see. Three Brief, beautiful sentences. Gently, Jesus led the two disciples of John to himself. The final step came during their conversation with Jesus, which lasted all night. Andrew and John became Jesus' disciples. Says John, in his inimitable style, 
they went, saw where he lived, and stayed with him the rest of the day. John chapter 1 verse 39. Went, saw, stayed. Went, saw, stayed. For the Jewish people, the day began at sunset. Hence for John, the night time he and Andrew spent in conversation with Jesus was part of the day. It was a whole night time, but for them it was the day. A bright day for them. Now what did they talk about? We shall never know what they talked about. But from the effects of that conversation, we can conclude that they felt irresistibly attracted to Jesus. They felt attracted to Jesus. They not only became his disciples there and then, but also came out from that encounter, eager to share the treasure they had found. Andrew ran and brought his brother Peter to Jesus. It is Andrew who brings Peter to Jesus after that spending the night with Jesus. John must have done the same with his brother James. Philip also happened to meet Jesus the next morning and he hastened to bring Nathaniel to Jesus. In narrating things the way he did, John the Evangelist wanted us all to recall to mind the way Jesus had led them to faith to himself. First, there had been a calling by Jesus. Normally, this calling by Jesus is not a direct call, but through a third person, someone who pointed Jesus to us. In their case, it was John the Baptist. In our case, it could have been our parents, a catechist, a friend, a priest, a sister. Apparently, things happened by chance, but it was not so. It was Jesus who arranged things to the least detail with infinite love so that we can meet him. Second step, we started learning about Jesus. The more we learned about him, the stronger was the attraction we felt towards him. And we kept on learning. Finally, we became Jesus' disciples. We decided to remain with him all the day. That is for the rest of our lives. That is why we were baptized. We were confirmed. The decision was not so much ours as Jesus, who led us to it through the Holy Spirit. Now, once we came to faith in Jesus, we felt the urge to share our good fortune with others, with everyone else. The joy we felt within us was like a fire which we could not contain. We were eager to bring Jesus to others, to, to those around us, such as our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our friends. We longed to see everyone becoming Jesus' disciple. And here comes the important reflection John the Evangelist wants us to make on recalling us our first encounter with Jesus. John the Evangelist wants us to ask ourselves this question. Years have passed since you came to faith in Jesus. Do you still feel the same eagerness to know more and more about Jesus? Are you still as keen as they were to bring more and more people to Christ? If Christ has no appeal, dear brothers and sisters, for us the way he once did, that means that we have not remained his true disciples all the day. When he told us, come and stay, probably we did not go with him. We went somewhere else. So we ask ourselves, have we stopped walking with him or do we follow him from far, half-heartedly? If so, we must find a remedy to this situation without delay. We must still be enthusiastic about our faith and about sharing our faith with our brothers and sisters, about being true missionaries. Experience has taught us that there are various obstacles which prevent us from following Jesus faithfully. All these obstacles can be reduced to three. Pride, human pride, 
greed for material things especially, and impurity. All the three, pride, greed, and impurity, make us stay far away from Christ. Because of them, some people were prevented from following Jesus right from the start. We all have known of people who once showed keen interest in becoming Christians, but never did so, either because of pride or because of greed or because of impurity. They could not convince themselves to break with sin. Others did become Christians and follow Jesus joyfully, but only for a time. They reverted to their sins and walked away. The second reading, St. Paul puts us on our guard against a sin that causes particular havoc in Christian life, namely the sin of impurity. Impurity. There had been serious scandals among the Christians of Corinth. In his letter to them, St. Paul points out to them and to us all the various reasons why Christians should lead pure lives. And he names those reasons. The first reason he gives them why they should live pure life is that we are not our own masters. We belong to the one who bought us at a very high price. We belong to Christ who ransomed, ransomed us with his own blood. And that is the reason why we must take special care when handling our bodies because our bodies do not belong to us. Therefore, we should never put our bodies to a sinful use. Our bodies belong to Christ more than it belongs to us. That is the first reason why you and I must strive to be pure. The second reason he gives is, we ought to lead a pure life because each one of us is a member of a larger body. That is the body of Christ, which is the church. He is the head, the rest are members. We know in a family, when one member of the family goes astray, the whole family is put to shame. All of us are affected. All members are affected. Similarly, in the body of the church, when one member goes astray, don't think the church is unaffected. No, the whole body is affected by the sin of every member. That is why St. Paul says, do not put Christ to shame. He is the head of the body of which we are all members. When we sin, we put Christ to shame. By, we put Christ to shame from the pagans, from the unbelievers. That is why we must avoid especially sins of impurity. The second reason that the, the third reason that he gives why we should strive for purity is this. He tells us our body is the temple of the Spirit, temple of the Holy Spirit. We know temples should not be profaned. We, should, we will all rise in anger against anyone daring profane our church. If someone comes and profanes our church, all of us would be up in arms. Yet, our church is built up with materials which have no life. They are built with stones, sand, cement, metals. Instead, our bodies are temples of the Spirit, living temples of God. All the more careful should we be to respect our bodies at all times. And Jesus said, this body is supposed to be a temple, giving praise and honor to the Father, and not a place, a den of thieves. In the same first letter of St. Paul to the Christians of Corinth, there is another passage in which he warns his Christians against impurity in the severest terms. It's very severe. He tells them, if anybody should destroy the temple of God, God will destroy him because the temple of God is sacred and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. That is enough reason why we must strive to remain pure. But there is a fourth reason why we must strive to be pure. That is, we must lead pure lives since our body is destined to rise on the last day. Our body is destined to rise. 
we know that Christ rose from the dead after having destroyed sin on the cross. If impurity were to hold us, to get hold of us, it would prevent our body from rising into glory. If we are impure, we would rise to eternal shame. In a word, impurity destroys the life in the spirit within us. Besides acting like a cancerous cell that corrodes the whole of Christian life, it destroys our being. Experience has taught us that many young men and women who followed Christ joyfully for years abandoned the church when fallen into the sin of impurity. At times, whole families have been destroyed and lost to the church for the same reason, impurity, infidelity in married life. Let us therefore be watchful. Dear brothers and sisters, let me conclude. Remember, on this day, how Christ called us one day and we how we followed him joyfully. We should often recall to mind the joy we felt when we first believed in Him, when we first received Him on the day of our first Holy Communion, the, our initial joy, our enthusiasm for Christ. He continues to call us in many ways. We ought to show our readiness to follow Him faithfully at all times, to listen to His voice when He speaks to us. Eagerness to make Jesus known to bring others to believe in him will prove that we are genuine disciples of his. And finally, no, impurity destroys our Christian life and the life of our Christian community. The thought that we belong to God, that we are members of Christ's body, that, are, that we are living temples of the Spirit ought to move us to lead a pure life. Following Jesus faithfully in this life assures us of of remaining with him forever in the life to come. And so we pray. Father, we thank you for having given us the light to acknowledge Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord. Give us the strength to follow Jesus faithfully and to announce him to everyone around us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Following the spirituality and teachings of St. Francis de Sales, the doctor of charity, Philothea missionaries are priests, religious sisters, lay women and men serving the church in various ministries specifically by engaging in the apostolates of education, health care, communication, family, youth ministry, and formation of the laity. Philothea missionaries offer retreat programs every first and last Saturday of the month at St. Francis de Sales Family Spiritual Center at Kisarian and run various formation programs at the St. John Paul II College for youth and family. If you wish to design your life vocation to be a priest or a religious nun or a lay missionary, or for more information on our ministries, please call 0725-075-566 or 0731-745-680. Or you can write to us at philotheacenter at yahoo.com. You may also visit our website www.philotheamission.org. 